All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the third day of January in the year of our Lord, 2023. One year closer to his return, which should be coming, well, just about any day now. Um, yeah, I think that we have had the revelation of the man of sin uh, <clears throat> already. Uh, it's the in the culture. It's not. I don't believe that's an individual. I think the man of sin is, well, Adam, unclothed, uh, with fig leaves ripped away. Yeah, humanity. Uh, what do we see going on in the world? Obviously, the restraining influence, whatever that is, has been taken out of the way. There is no restraint, especially in Western culture. The Western world, it is committing suicide. Oh, well, thank God that, uh, that Russia's been separated from us. <laughs> they have a chance. Which is interesting. I think that's in accordance with God's uh, grace and wisdom and mercy, too, that, that God decided, well, I think it's time to put that iron curtain back up. Well, who built the wall this time? Yeah, it's, it's weird. The United States will not build a wall on the southern border or finish the wall. But they, they, they're they perfectly willing to, to build a wall around everybody else. Russia, China. By the way, Taiwan is a part of China. Taiwan belongs to China. It's the Chinese people. They're the last holdouts of the uh, Chinese Civil War that ended, really, in 1949 with the victory of the Communists. It goes all the way back to pre-World War II, by the way. Uh, it's interesting, communism is not a Chinese ideology. It's a Western ideology, Marx and Engels. Oh, yes, uh, the Enlightenment has brought so many blessings to the world including Nazism. Did you know Hitler was a product of the Enlightenment? He was also a Roman Catholic. Uh, never excommunicated by that organization either. In fact, he and the Pope uh, had a treaty, a concordant. Basically, you leave me alone and I'll leave you alone. <laughs> Oh, well, he sort of, uh, his SS was styled after the Jesuit order, too, including the black uniforms. He always did admire that. Uh, if you've ever read any of Hitler's writings and some of the history, I mean, not the Western propaganda, one of the disturbing things about Hitler, I remember reading some of Hitler's stuff uh, as a Christian, and I, and I was thinking, you know, this was just an ordinary man, and but for the grace of God, go I. You know, uh, I could have been Adolf Hitler. It, you see, we want to make things like Hitler into this monster that's not a son of Adam. There's a reason why. Because if we realize, no, Hitler was just a, an ordinary human being, not some special demonic entity. It shows us how evil we are, too. Humanity. Oh, by the way, it's very early. <laughs> what is today? Tuesday? Yeah, Tuesday. I always get messed up on the uh, holiday weekends. Well... Since I'm retired, one day is the same as another. 
<coughs> Excuse me. I'm still covering, recovering from the tridemic, or who knows what they call it now. Um, I did notice, though, the other day, my, my sense of smell has apparently ceased to exist. I, we had pizza the other day, and I, I can't smell this. I can't smell this. I went in and opened a bottle of cologne that I never use, and I can't smell it. <laughs> What's that a symptom of? I don't know. I don't care. God is my salvation. He is my physician. If God doesn't want to keep me alive, then I don't want to stay alive. But one thing I'll never do again is take another mRNA vaccine. Oh, I had concerns about it then, and and I said, well, God can protect me from that, too. Well, <laughs> pretty much. I thought when I put it in there, I thought, that looks like water to me. And I had the same effect. That particular one, the J&J, one-shot wonder. Um, and I did not get it because I was afraid of COVID. Like I said, whether I live or die, I am the Lord's. I mean, what difference does it make? It's all in his hands. But if you, you probably don't believe that, <laughs> unless you're a born-again Christian. All right, uh, what I want to talk about today is the difference between institutional Christianity and real Christianity, again, because, well, in the United States here, I, I, you know, regardless of what church I try to attend, it's like, yeah, there are people there that are born again. I can pretty much recognize some people that, yeah, I think he's probably born again. But it's like, where is, you know, this, this isn't the church. This is a religious activity center. That's all, pretty much. I don't care what denomination it is. Uh, or more accurately, a sect with their own standards of membership. That I can't abide. I mean, I, I, I do know of one traditional Lutheran church that does pretty good. The preacher, it depends on the preacher. Um, at preaching Christ and Him crucified, focusing on Christ and the cross. And I, I like that. I like that. I don't really mind the liturgy. Um, their liturgy is sung and a little complex, but, I mean, the liturgy is something it takes a while for people to get used to anyway. If they change it on you, everybody will complain. Uh, but, uh, yeah, um, but the fact is there's a few things about it. I'm not a Lutheran anymore. You know, I could attend there. But I couldn't join uh, because they have a standard of membership right here, this book. <laughs> you have to agree with this. And I said, that's not the Bible. It's a sect. It's a sect. And, they, um, you know, the, the, what really makes it a sect, you know, it, I, I think the one thing that puts me off on this, and it's it, the local pastor isn't responsible for this. But this is my main issue. I don't believe in, in sacramentarianism, but I can tolerate it. Um, Christ really present in the Eucharist? Yeah, he's really present in the congregation. Where two or more gather together in my name, there I am in your midst. And But I, I, I tend to take a biblical view of the bread and the wine, which is the bread of the Passover and the wine of the Passover that Jesus said, this actually represents me and what I'm about to do. Do this in remembrance of me, of his, of his death that very day on the cross. That's what it's supposed to be about, recalling what he did for us. It's not a m way to eat grace, very materialistic understanding which comes from unregenerate people because they can't see the kingdom of God. Um, I know a lot of people, I, I, I cause confusion, but it's not because necessarily of what I say, although that can be confusing too. And sometimes what I say is not what I think I'm saying. That is disturbing. Uh, brain malfunction. I suppose I could uh, blame it on the coof, huh? 
except it pre-existed that. Anyway, um, I, 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 for some reason, um, YouTube vomited up John MacArthur on my YouTube homepage. Uh, I, John MacArthur is one big question mark. I don't think he's born again. Uh, in fact, I remember he said, I think uh, he had a conference a number of years ago, one of his conferences, um, Strange Fire, uh, where he attacked the charismatic Pentecostal movement. Not that they don't observe, uh, deserve to be attacked vociferously, because as all movements, it, they've gone far, far, far from where they began. Now, the beginnings of uh, the Pentecostal movement in down in Texas and Oklahoma there with and then out in Los Angeles was weird. That was that should simply have been rejected because it deserves to be rejected. And the whole emphasis on speaking in tongues, those aren't speaking in tongues. It's not. It's not tongues. It's not. It's not. The word tongues means languages. Just open the Bible. When you have, every time, you know, um, on... Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. The, the, in fact, the scripture says that tongues are assigned to unbelievers. How can you, who don't know my language, speak in my language? They're real languages. And if they're not real languages, they're not biblical. The word tongues means languages. They're not biblical tongues. If they're not real languages. So if linguists look at it and say, that's not a language. It's not a language. Languages have property. I took a course in linguistics at the uh, University of Wisconsin at Madison. That was useful. At that time, I still practiced some of that nonsense. Eventually, I came to the point that to, where I was able to say, this is nonsense, it's not biblical, because they instill fear in you. Um, that you will somehow be blaspheming in the Holy Spirit if you say that what this is going on isn't of God. Well, it's not of God. God gives you the love of truth. God does not want you to believe nonsense. But uh, one thing about uh, the Pentecostal and charismatic movement, I, I'll say the charismatic movement, because that's more recent, so it's not so quite so... Uh, well, <laughs> institutionalized. Um, a char charismatics don't have a problem with the idea that you have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, with God through Christ, uh, unless they're just a hanger on her. And there's there's plenty of those too. You know, a follower of Joel Osteen, or you know, char the charismatic movement rapidly became a a, a cesspool. Uh, but originally, I remember the beginnings of it. I mean, it was, uh, what, a uh, Anglican priest out on the West Coast. Oh, was it back 1967 or something like that, back in the 60s? Uh, had the experience of speaking in tongues. Well, he went looking for it, too. But Whereas I simply was forcibly dragged into it, literally. <laughs> literally. Uh, and I always had questions about it. Is this real or not? And eventually I came to the conclusion after many years and hearing many things. No, it's not. And the linguistics uh, course helped me because it, it taught me about uh, the essentials of language and everything else. I had never thought about that. So. No, this stuff is not language. So, But the, the thing they do have is that, that generally speaking, is... Uh, the idea that you have to have a personal relationship with God. See, that, that the evangelicalism existed prior to... Really, you know, go, you go back to the, the so-called Great Awakening um, with Whitfield and Wesley. What do Whitfield and Wesley have in common? They preached, you must be born again. And the institutional churches in England locked the doors on them. They had to preach in the fields. Wesley and Whitfield, you know, they had different theologies, but they both preached you must be born again. There must be something God does. God makes you a Christian, as the scripture 
plainly teaches. See, we're talking about biblical Christianity. And I get comments every once in a while. Like I might make a comment on some of these videos that, or whatever posts that uh, Christianity is a relationship. It's not a religion. And somebody else, it is a religion. Of course it's a religion. No, it's not. It's not a religious system. It's a relationship, a proper relationship with God, a rest restoration to a proper relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what it is. It's a relationship, a, uh, a covenant relationship, not a, a national or a relation covenant or anything like that, not a covenant of Moses, but God himself, the new covenant, does it. He's the one that you are begotten of God. He puts his spirit in you. He, he gives you a new, uh, makes you a new creation. And that's always a personal thing. And it can't happen because somebody sprinkles you with water. All that came about in history because the churches became filled with dead men. They could not see the kingdom of God. They weren't born again. So it's like a blind man explaining colors to a person born blind. They have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, shortly before I was, God arranged it. When In my case, I uh, was not exposed to any of this stuff growing up as a Lutheran. They didn't talk about being born again. They didn't call people to salvation. They assume because you had been sprinkled, you were a Christian. And then they confirmed you as one because they puts you through a course of Thursday night something or other, catechism, a memorizing Luther's small catechism, and then they called in some character, some sort of bishop, and he laid hands on you after you renounced the world, the flesh, and the devil, and proclaimed your faith, <laughs> what you had been taught in the previous three years, and now pronounced you a full member of the church, filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Didn't work. It was simply an empty ritual. I believed. I believed. I believed in God. I never was an atheist. But I did not have a personal relationship with him other than a guilty relationship with him. The relationship of God and a sinner. That's the relationship I had uh, until I was born again. Then a God and one of his children. That's different. That still has sin, but he's taking care of that too. So uh, I'm going to look at that. And, and I, when, when God called me to himself, and yes, God calls people. Uh, you, re you have to respond, but God calls uh, what happened, the period of time that I got saved in was is what's known as the, the Jesus Revolution. Or, and the people that, that came to Christ at that time were commonly called, or were commonly called, Jesus Freaks. Let's see here. And uh, I came to Christ in 1976. I was in the military. You know, I was in North Dakota. It was hardly, you know, like L.A. down on the beach or anything like that. But there was other people that God brought across my path while I was in the military that were born-again believers. Some of them weird, Pentecostals, too, or Charismatics. Um, but they, they, they had a personal relationship with God. And they were aware of it. It's not an abstract... Like if you have a personal relationship with someone, you know you have a personal relationship with someone, right? If they don't know you, you don't have a personal relationship with them. If you don't know them, you don't have a personal relationship with them. I've got shelves full of theologians here, generally Calvinists, who would argue, well, with Augustine and Aristotle, that you can't know God. But the Bible says something different. 
uh, knowing God is not about exhaustive intellectual knowledge. It's about a relationship. And people when I try to say Christianity is a relationship, they're like, no, it's a religion. <laughs> well, their Christianity is a religion, not a relationship, obviously. They don't know any better. Neither did I. Neither did I. Um, I remember one... Um, I was reading the Bible. I did do that, even though I didn't understand it very well. And my roommate, who apparently was a born-again believer, asked me, saw me doing that, are you born again? And I looked at him and I, what? Uh, uh, oh, I was baptized and confirmed. <laughs> I figured he had so it had something to do with being a Christian. <laughs> and he just basically figured... No, you're not. Just drop the subject. But it raised a question to my mind, what in the world is he talking about? And then I'd have to have another roommate like that, another roommate like that. There seemed to be a lot of these strange people around then, young people. You know, we were, we were all talking, you know, if you were 21 years old, you were an old man. One of my roommates who wasn't necessarily born again Christian, um, uh, was he was they everybody called him an old man because he was 21 uh, which is how old i became was i think it was about my 21st birthday that god saved me uh, anyway the jesus movement i'm, I'm going to look at this a little bit here because it was the last i think the last real movement of god in the United States and in in Western Europe too, it didn't just strictly in the United States. I mean, there was there was it was the last thing you could call a revival. Uh, revival is not really a good word because revival is like reviving people, whereas it's really life from the dead, uh, resurrection, not revival, or uh, new birth. It's it's a beginning of something you didn't have before. See, that's the thing. You're born dead. You're born dead in trespasses and sins. You're born separated from God. It's, it's, not, it's not you had a relationship and it needs to be revived. No. That's what Church of Christ would believe. They're simply wrong. They're a dead intellectual cult. Uh, generally. I know there's exceptions, perhaps. but uh, That's where they started. One of those American cults that popped up like mushrooms back in the early 1800s. Uh, the Jesus movement was an evangelical Christian movement that began on the West Coast of the United States in the late 60s and early 70s. Pretty much, uh, think of uh, Chuck Smith and Calvary Chapel. Um, some, some young people, uh, Lonnie. Frisbee, uh, sometimes is credited as, as starting it. He basically gathered a bunch of hippies around himself and started talking about God, but he had no idea what he was talking about. Turns out uh, he was never really saved either. Eventually he died of AIDS. Uh, one of the problems with some of these young people, they came out of you know the, the, the hippie culture and the free love and, you know, there's... You know, Godless, a lot of these people had no Christian background. Uh, California. <laughs> or they came out of something like John MacArthur's church. Uh, <clears throat> I, I heard a message of his on bo being born again. Nah, I don't think he... He might be able to read the words in the book, but I don't think he has it. Uh, as he said during uh, his Strange Fire conference, uh, I believe it was during that, I heard him say, uh, MacArthur referring to himself, I don't have a spiritual bone in my body. Yeah, I can sort of believe that. Uh, he was the son of a preacher and the grandson of a preacher, and his parents decided that he would become a preacher and instill that desire in him. Uh, he has, in his autobiography, he has no account 
of his personal salvation and a personal relationship with God. It's just not present. I don't think like it's present in his life. He preaches out of the Bible, but do you know Christ? That's different. No, he's institutional. Uh, fundamentalists often talk about the need for conversion, the need to be born again, and he sort of comes out of a fundamentalist background. Uh, but what they're talking about tends not to be what the Bible's talking about. Uh, often. I would say they're very mixed. Some of them very, some, a few, uh, are very good. Uh, and many more are not. Not. So you, you can win a lot of popularity by being against things. And people think you're a Christian because you preach against sin, you preach against homosexuality, you preach against uh, all those things that aren't in your church. <laughs> but that's preaching against things isn't preaching Jesus Christ. Uh, that's, you know, you can preach the Bible. I've heard lots of people preach the Bible. But do they know God? Do they know what the new covenant is? Do they have Christ in them? Uh, too often not. But the, uh, okay, the, the evangelical Christian was an evangelical Christian movement that began on the West Coast, the United States in the late 60s and early 70s, yes, and primarily spread to North America, Europe, and Central America, where it subsided in the late 80s. Pretty much, yeah, it became commercialized. Uh, American um, capitalism, godless capitalism, corrupts everything. They turned it into a business, what happened. That'll kill anything. American capitalism kills everything. Because it's a love of money, which is absolutely contrary. See, that was... Uh, what happened was it wasn't so much the people in the movement did this. It's others saw it as an opportunity to make money. Other so-called evangelicals. The gospel of wealth. No. They killed it, partially, along with a lot of error and uh, people that were, well, like Lonnie Frisbee. Uh, people that weren't really born again. And a lot of there's a lot of hanger honors too that were caught up in the thrill of this new thing. It's like recently there was the 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 Calvinist resurgence, you know. That was a lot about young people, oh this is different. It's different. It's different. Let's go join this different thing. And then they all dropped away because they it wasn't of God. Calvinism is not of God. It's an ism. There is no... Christianity is not an ism. It's a relationship with God. And it's not a set of doctrines. You know, a five-volume set of... Is it five or four? Four. Bavink, which is one of the better theologies, by the way. Uh... Bobbing certainly better than some of the Americans. Uh, these people, these these professors that say you can't know God, that God is so, you know. Yeah, I, I remember uh, uh, the first church I joined as a believer. I'd gone back to my home church for a while when I came out of the Air Force. But it was a fundamentalist Baptist with a a Spurgeonist pastor. Another Spurgeon was a Baptist Calvinist. But his Calvinism never got in the way of the gospel, unlike 
so many others that never know what the gospel is. Uh, but the uh, I remember him saying that he, he always was trying to make this this huge distinction: God's here and we're here, and, and you know, there's no real nothing going on in between, no connection there. That's not true at all. It certainly wasn't true with Spurgeon. Oh, man. That guy eventually ended up leaving the ministry and opening a donut and, paste, uh, donut and coffee shop uh, featuring people like Thoreau and like... <clears throat> I mean, we're, we, were, we are contemporaries. I mean, within a year or two of each other. Out of the frying pan and into the fire. He always was a little bit of a rebel for a fundamentalist, too. Which, you know, this, he had a motorcycle. And a beard, I think. See, those kind of things should get you banned among fundamentalists. Uh, anyway. <clears throat> The the uh, the Jesus movement though it was its predecessor the charismatic movement ah uh, no I would not say that uh, it had a predecessor it was definitely something no because um, th th this is the ignorance of Wikipedia <laughs> no that that's not you know they had people like Lonnie Frisbee you had these hippies out in California. Uh, if you go back and you read uh, Francis Schaeffer and some of his works, and and he had an establishment over in Switzerland, a, a house where people from all over the world, young people, would come and listen to him. And he was he was uh, um, reformed, a Calvinist, but he was not bound to it. So he would explain things in a more biblical and rational, uh, real way. Uh, so, unlike the uh, absolute predestination of all things, I think he did not necessarily hold to that, which is the core of Calvinism. So, uh, <clears throat> American Calvinism, this this new Calvinism is not real. It's, I mean, who cares what John Calvin said anyway? Uh, or Martin Luther, or Pope Francis. They're not God, even if they think they are. Well, at least Luther, well, no, Luther can get, be pretty popish at times. God, yeah, you could come to think of it. Yeah, if they ask you why Luther changed the Bible here, just tell them, because Dr. Luther said so. Uh, actually, I think I was referring to uh, uh, the insertion of alone, faith alone which is not an illegitimate translation because the context certainly bears that out. The entire context of the New Testament bears that out. Uh, the entire context of the Old Testament bears that out, too, really. Circumcision bears that out. It's supposed to be a reminder that salvation is by grace through faith and not of works. So what do the Jews do? Turn it into a work. By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Not even flesh that is cut off. All right. So anyway, uh, no, it wasn't. The charismatic movement preceded it by a few years. The charismatic movement actually got a big bump from the Jesus movement. I would say the Jesus movement was definitely bigger and earlier than the charismatic movement. Although it was in different areas, see the the charismatic movement was a a it's not Pentecostalism, but the idea of the of the gifts of the Spirit uh, moved into traditional dead denominations like the Anglicanism and Lutheranism and Roman Catholicism and everything else, and had nothing to do with sound doctrine or Jesus Christ or the gospel, really. Uh, it was an ex 
experience thing, but it was not genuine. It's a deception because it's not, you know, it's, it's not speaking in tongues, and, which is the, the fund, foundation of it. There's people, you can, you, people speak in tongues. When you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you speak in tongues. Not true because what they're doing is not speaking in tongues. And they refuse to even debate that issue. I know I've tried to work. Yeah, I, mean, I practiced it for over a decade. So, okay. I got dragged into it, but no, it's not. It's not real. Um, and there's lots of claims move, uh, made about things and uh, so-called miracles. And a lot of those are like, well, that's just what God does all the time anyway. Or, you know, raising people from the dead and things like that, walking on water and multiplying food. Prove it. I want real evidence. They never have real evidence. It's just hearsay or wishful thinking. You know, like, well, we had a bunch of food that we'd prepared for a, a thing down in Mexico and uh, more people showed up than we thought we had food for, but somehow there was enough food. Well, unless you can quantitatively prove it, like, well, how, how do you prove that biblically? Remember Jesus fed 5,000? Actually, he probably did that a couple times. But feeding the 5,000, he said, take up all the scraps that remain, uh, that none be lost. And what did he have, like 12 basketfuls? So he started with uh, a, a few small barley buns, you know, cakes, like pancake size thing, a little little bread loaf, and uh, two small fish. And he ends up with, after everybody's eaten their fill, 5,000 people ate their filly as still 12 baskets of leftovers. Okay, that is a miracle, an objective miracle. Raising Lazarus from the dead in, the, in public, including at a, at a funeral. Uh, after Lazarus has been dead and buried for four days. Okay, that's a miracle. This charismatic crap's not a miracle. Not that God doesn't do things that are uh, providentially good, but as far as attesting signs that point to the authority of Christ and the authority of the gospel, a lot of these claims of miracles, you'll notice, these people weren't preaching the gospel anyway. If God was going to do a miracle today, uh, it would be a testimony to the message of the gospel uh, where it hasn't been present. And, uh, you know, like in some pagan area or something like that, uh, it's certainly possible for God to do that. But God is not going to bear witness to the authority of, of false messengers and people promoting false doctrines. That's contrary to the purpose of miracles. God does not bear witness to Jimmy Swagger and Joel Osteen and Joyce Myers and, and you know all these all other prosperity teachers and whatever or cult leaders doesn't do it. So there's a lot of self deception that goes around, on, especially in a population of young people that have dosed themselves with LSD and other things. <laughs> They're already pretty well loose, uh, detached from reality. But so is the rest of the world. Let me make this point. Um, the, that movement, one of the things behind it, one of the things that drove uh, these long-haired hippie freaks, which is what my grandfather would have called them, uh, to, and I, I never was a long-haired hippie freak, by the way. So it wasn't just people like that. But what the people that I think got um, uh, in this thing, were people that were looking for reality. And it's like the drug culture and the youth culture. They weren't finding reality there. We grew up, and I'm that generation, the baby boomer generation. We grew up after World War II 
uh, in America largely, and in prosperity, America was a dominant world power pretty much, at least naval and in the West, and uh, financially, industrially, we were the industrial superpower, the financial superpower of the world, and uh, we had all this stuff. Our parents had grown up during the Depression. They wanted this stuff. They wanted to own a house. My grandfather didn't own a house until after he retired. My father, I don't know how many houses he owned he uh, or, and built and everything else. He, he had, They'd grown up without these things. They'd grown up in rental property, same as my mother. And uh, it was... Only after World War II, and then uh, especially they did, even before their parents often, wanted those things that they didn't have when they were, uh, you know, during the Depression. You, and during the war, things were rationed. Food was rationed. Gas was rationed. Uh, they wanted the cars. My grandparents, both of them worked at General Motors building cars. And... Uh, so that, that that out of that, and they wanted uh, the, that prosperity for their children. Like my generation, I was the first of seven. And so then you have the baby boomer generation grows up with all this wealth and prosperity. I mean, it wasn't wealth like it was in the 70s and 80s. It was, you know, you had one car and maybe a, a small house, but it was your house. It was your house. You had a mortgage. Maybe you you had a professional job or something like that. And I mean, you were, you were on the, uh, that was something that was a lot. You were middle class. You weren't working class. You were middle class perhaps. And so there was a, and you know, like the people on the West coast or college students, and everything else, uh, you have these things, and you, unlike your parents, you grew up with this stuff, and you think, is this all there is? Of course, you also grew up under the threat of being incinerated in a nuclear holocaust. <laughs> but, I mean, that was a that was a real fear. And it's all, it was emphasized at times uh, when the news people came over and said, you should stay in your house and keep the windows closed today because we had a nuclear test out west that went a little bit of, uh, awry and there's a big cloud of fallout moving over the country right now. Yeah. Oh, by the way, the Russians have put nuclear missiles in Cuba. So it was not all prosperity. There was other things going on. But it, we were asking questions. You might have been raised in church like me, and it's like, okay. But is God real? I saw no reality. I, saw, I did not see God in church or in the lives of the people around me. Uh, how come you were like everybody else? Is God real? And there was the desire for some reality other than materialism cannot satisfy you. Uh, the scripture talks about, the, Jesus said, talked about the deceitfulness of riches. Life is not about possessions. And this culture will not accept that. But people were asking questions, and you have people experimenting in the youth movement, the college campuses and stuff, with all kinds of alternative lifestyles, uh, communes, and all this stuff. And in that, God decided to save some people. And bring, because who who is reality? It's God himself. He is truth. Nothing else is truth except God. He is the foundation of everything. And everything should revolve around him. And a culture that had forgotten God, and it had, 
America had always forgotten God. It was never a Christian nation. Uh, that, that is just a myth uh, spread by people that are trying to manipulate you. But no, it was uh, the founding fathers were, none of them were Christians, biblical Christians, absolutely not. They might have been members in institutional organizations, but that's not Christianity. It's a relationship with God through Christ. How many times will I have to say that? Maybe that maybe that will be my dying words. I don't know. Unless the Lord comes first. <laughs> but the, the Jesus movement or the uh, Jesus revolution has been called, it brought in all kinds of nonsense too. People, um, there was a lot of, you know, people thought, oh, I love this, I love Jesus and all this, and I love my rock and roll, and I love my drugs, and I love my homosexuality, too. So you had, uh, and some, uh, there was quite a few solid evangelical leaders. I think Chuck Smith is among them. He was mildly charismatic. That uh, uh, sought to uh, steer these young people in the right direction, and they did a pretty good job. But among them, the, the young people, those that had grown up in institutional churches, basically rejected them because they were dead, and they're still dead. They're still dead. They did not see Christ there, but Christ found them and saved them, and they have a real relationship with them. Why? What's there for me, you know? So, but once they grew up and had children and said to have families and they started going back, they're, well, I need to get my kids going, even if there's nothing alive there. <laughs> for the sake of the children, you know, well, didn't do them much good. You know, that's sort of a silly thing to do. But no, we have to have a real relationship with Christ. And the problem with these institutions is they, they don't. An institution cannot have a relationship with God. God has relationships with people, not things. So, yeah, there was a Campus Crusade for Christ and things like that. Good, bad, and ugly, uh, often mixtures. Uh, it was common to have Jesus festivals. I went to one or two of those. Um <laughs> Uh, you had young people that had come out of the world. Uh, Keith Green, musicians, uh, were fairly uh, if you could write a song, you could lead a church, right? Uh, yeah. It says here, it talks about the uh, Jesus People USA, which is in Chicago. That's um, no, that's uh, the dead bones of that movement. A vineyard churches, no, they have nothing at all to do other than people that were in the Jesus movement might have fallen for some of this nonsense. Jews for Jesus, yeah, they were sort of part of it. Uh, CCM, Contemporary Christian Music, definitely. Uh, they brought in, you know, they, they were, uh, in a lot of ways it was... Uh, a mix. There, there was, there was. I think a lot of the people that were involved in it were caught up in the excitement, just like the recent Calvinist resurgence. They were caught up in the excitement, but didn't have the reality. Of course, Calvin, the Calvinist resurgence couldn't bring reality because it wasn't about a relationship with God, but the Jesus movement was. See, that was the central thing, as I mentioned the Pentecostal and Charismatic, too, is, is uh, you don't find questions among Charismatics, or typically Pentecostals, about uh, Christianity being relationship with God, personal relationship. It's, that's what evangelicalism was uh, prior to its total corruption, too. And all the Pentecostalism and that came out of evangelicalism it was a corruption of it, but uh, real evangelicalism is not what's around today. It was about 
the necessity to be born again, the necessity to have a real relationship with God. Uh, but people, because the churches are flooded with people that don't have that, even the remembrance of what was preached by Wesley and uh, Whitfield, the real message of that time and throughout history, is corrupted because they have no understanding of, of what real Christianity is. As, as a blind man, born blind, has no understanding, could have an intellectual understanding of it, of color. You could intellectually explain the physics of color to a person, and they could imagine something, but their imagination would not correspond with reality because they, it's something you have to experience. God is real, and you can't, uh, is not a set of doctrines. So let's go to the scripture. I'm going to try to explain this biblically. John chapter 3. Uh, I can remember, some of you might be able to remember when uh, Jimmy Swagger, uh, Jimmy Swagger, oh boy, the idea of Jimmy Swagger as president of the United States. Oh man, wait a minute. We had Bill Clinton. I was just, oh my. You know, being, having been a pastor can be disturbing. I'm thinking of the the first church I was the pastor of. Uh, we one of the probably the leading man in the church. You know, you have older men that that were more senior, but no, the the, the, the you know a guy that's a businessman and you know. Uh, probably the largest contributor. I remember it, I, when I was there, it was Clinton was running for re-election or something, and, you know, I probably preached something that we should not elect immoral people. And I would have been re-elected. You know, because it's... there. We can't make it... There, there is no divide between personal morality and public morality. You, that That's nonsense. If you're immoral, you're immoral in many aspects. It's not a, it doesn't re confine itself to one area. Uh, I mean, Bill Clinton, who was supposedly a Southern Baptist, although his church would not discipline him, was amoral. He was, uh, was a politician. He did not have a personal relationship with God because God would have smacked him down. You know, when God receives you as his child, he disciplines you. You can't get away with that kind of nonsense if you belong to God. So one thing, you know, to be, if you're born again, you're conscious of the fact that you belong to Jesus Christ. You've been bought with a price, as the scripture says. You're not your own. He redeemed you. He called you. He chose you. He saved you. You belong to him. If you don't aren't aware that you belong, I mean, aware of the fact that you belong to Christ, not to doctrine, the reality of it, well, then you may not be born again. <laughs> John chapter 3, there was a man of the Pharisees. These are like the fundamentalists. Named Nicodemus, except they weren't fundamentalists. They were the the holy ones, the, the man of the uh, of the uh, Nazarenes. Uh, they were the one, they were the religious people. They were they were the serious ones about Moses and the law and God's covenant. They were the separated from the the worldly. A ruler of the Jews, a man named Nicodemus. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of Israel. Uh, he was a rabbi, a teacher. 
This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you, we know, the Sanhedrin knows, the leadership knows that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs. So I, I don't think Nicodemus came secretly not to be seen by the uh, uh, leadership, but rather he came perhaps as a representative of the leadership in the Sanhedrin. But the Sanhedrin didn't want it to be known that they were uh, talking to him. That seems, since we know you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. The Sanhedrin, the leadership and the, the chief priests, they always knew who Jesus was. Especially after he raised Lazarus from the dead. And that's when they finally said, we got to kill this guy. They knew he was from God. They knew he was doing miracles that no one else had ever done. They knew he was fulfilling the prophecies. They knew he was the Messiah. And that's why they got rid of him. Except that was God's plan. Uh, they weren't born again. So you, here you got uh, Nicodemus, who is a leader of the Jewish people, the, the people of God, a teacher, respected, and he comes to Jesus and says, we know that you are a teacher from God. Because no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So he, they know that Jesus is from God. And Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, he doesn't really respond to what Nicodemus is saying. I say to you, unless one is born again or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. <laughs> Nicodemus is probably, what? What? Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? See, Jesus was addressing Nicodemus and everybody else. Can he enter into a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Uh, Nicodemus isn't stupid. He knows Jesus doesn't mean that. But he's stating the obvious in order to get a clarification. Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit. This is not baptism. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is, and here's why, it's not baptism. That which is born of flesh is flesh. Water, born of flesh. If you don't know what that, why there's a connection there, you're not a father or a mother. <laughs> yes, what comes f when a child is born, what's the first thing that issues forth? Water, the amniotic fluid, water, which is almost entirely water. My water broke. Husbands probably have heard that. Fathers have heard those words. Get a towel, and we got to go to the hospital. <laughs> yep, because that is the sign that birth is imminent. <sighs> that which is born of flesh, natural man. That which is born of Adam is Adam. That which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Why you have to be born again, born from above, born of spirit. You have been born of flesh, because you can't enter the kingdom of God unless you come into existence, period. But you have to be born of the spirit, because you're born dead. Dead in Adam, dead in sin, cut off from God. The human race fell. In Adam. 
There is not a proper relationship between man and God because of sin. And you cannot do anything but sin unless God is in you. Only God is good. If you're separated from that which is good, you can't do good. Do mar not marvel that I say to you, uh, said to you, you must be born again. I say it's not about baptism, water baptism. That's People don't understand the scripture. They don't understand the gospel. They insert their own understandings. It's pretty obvious. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but it cannot, uh, but cannot tell from where it come, it, where it comes from, and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. The word "wind" is the word "pneuma" in Greek, and the word "spirit" is the word "pneuma" in Greek. So Jesus is doing a little play on word here. Uh, yeah, you can't see the wind. You can see the results of the wind. You don't know where the wind's coming from and where it's going. <laughs> of course, nowadays we know it's coming from a high-pressure center and going to a low-pressure center, but we don't know exactly how it gets there. I don't... We, we can just... We know in general... But when, if sometimes, if you're out in the wind, sometimes just just realize it because you know the turbulence and everything else. They'll they'll be windy one second and then it won't be windy, and then the wind will come from a different different direction. And especially if you're around uh, structures or trees or whatever, you don't know where it's coming from, really. Of course, especially in his day, uh, Jesus knew where it was coming from, but Nicodemus didn't. You know, the wind blows. You can say it's blowing out of the east right now or blowing out of the west, but do you know where it's going? Look on a weather map. It doesn't go in straight lines. It goes in big circles. And on a small scale, too. You don't know. You can't see it, but you can see it moving things around. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. You cannot see the new birth. But you can see the effects of the new birth. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? How, how can you teach Israel? You don't understand what the Word of God says. Aha, uh -huh. see, it's in the Word of God. It's in the prophets. It's in the law. Don't you get it? How can you teach Israel if you don't understand basic things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak that which we know and testify uh, what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. He puts it in the plural there, doesn't he? We, like Father, Son, and Spirit, we speak, we testify, we witness. I have told you, if I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how can uh, you believe? Well, how you will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? If I've told you of things that are of this age, and basic ABCs, like you must be born again because you're dead. Going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Uh, if, if you don't get that, how can I tell you of heavenly things? Things that you can't see. Of supernatural things. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven. That is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. That's a claim to deity, by the way. Jesus is not only on earth, he's in heaven at that moment. How can you do that? Well, because Jesus is more than the Son of Man. He's the Son of God. He is God, as John made clear in chapter 1 of his gospel. 
And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Nicodemus knew exactly what Jesus was talking about as far as Moses and the serpent. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Uh, God sent a plague of serpents upon Israel in the wilderness because of their ungratefulness and grumbling and desiring to go back to Egypt. And they were many people were dying, and God told uh, Moses to make the image a bronze serpent and put it on a pole and lift it up, and whoever will, and God gave the promise that well, whoever will look upon the serpent in faith, in other words, uh, will be healed. And so it was. And Jesus is saying, I'm that. We show over that whoever believes in him, the Son of Man, that will be lifted up, should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him, believing in him, in Christ, not in a set of doctrines, not in an institution, not in having participated in certain sacraments, not in doing your thing, but trusting in Christ, in God's salvation. The word Jesus, the name Jesus means God our salvation, or God saves, or God is salvation. Yahshua. Same word, is, same name as Joshua, by the way. Joshua. English corrupted it. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Well, Jesus commonly called himself the son of man, so here he is telling Nicodemus that he is the son of God, too. <coughs> <coughs> Yet there are some so-called Christians that say, Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God. Apparently, they've never read the Bible. They're blinded. They're not born again. They're dead in trespasses and sins. They don't want to believe because to believe that he is the Son of God makes them accountable to him. Did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. His first coming is about salvation. His second coming is about judgment. And the, the physical establishment of his kingdom over all, all the world. He who believes in him. The, belief, the word belief, pistis, is, it has to do with not just intellectual knowledge, but trust. Trust! It's trusting in him. It, it's a, a relationship with him. It is confidence in him as a person, not as an idea, not as a doctrine. He that believes in him is not condemned, not judged. But he that does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, the only one that has come down from heaven. And the word there is monogenes, only begotten. Don't let anybody tell you or any translation tell you otherwise. It has a much deeper meaning than the one and only. That That is, you know, you got these modern paraphrase, semi-paraphrase Bibles that are pilot dung. How dare they alter the words of Christ? It's bad enough they have to translate them into English. It's, it's hard to translate, by the way. But uh, don't change it because you think it's better. That's exactly what Pope Francis did with the Lord's Prayer. Well, I don't like the Lord's Prayer, so I'm going to, by my authority, change the words of Jesus. Well, <clears throat> What has God promised to those who do things like that? I think these translators ought to fear because they're unfaithful to God and, you know, 
God's words don't need to be improved. They do have to be written in current language, though. King James is uh, out of date by 400 years. It's not bad, but they can at times be a little confusing. He who believes in him, believes in him, not believes that he is. It's, it's a matter not only of believing that Jesus is who he claims to be, but trusting in him personally. <clears throat> and this is the condemnation, the judgment, that the light has come into the world. Jesus is the light. And men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Evil people don't like lights. That's why you put security lights up. They don't want to be seen doing what they do, sneaking around, looking hot at a way to get in your house. For everyone <coughs> practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, <coughs> lest his deeds should be exposed. <coughs> But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds might be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Well, to be done in God, you have to be born again first. God has to be in you. God has to be doing his works in you. Because only God is good. So you, you need that real relationship with God to do anything, anything good. Everything else is evil. Without that, your life has to be in proper relationship with God or you're uh, belong in Gehenna, in the garbage dump of the universe, the where garbage and everything dirty is burnt. The old landfills, if you can remember those, remember you could smell them a mile away because they would burn the garbage before they buried it. I can still smell that. My grandfather's house was about a mile from the city dump. Uh, downwind. Yeah, you could smell it at times. See, evil people hide their deeds. But Jesus is light, so they tend to flee from him. God has to call you. I mean, otherwise you'll just go on your merry way. But his call can involves, to begin with, especially conviction of your sin. It's only when you come to realize what you actually are, how bad you are, that you be, have a growing desperation to be saved from yourself. A lot of people, you know, they want to be saved from judgment. They want to be saved from the consequences of sin. But they really don't want to be saved from sin. They're perfectly content with their sin. They love their sin. They haven't been convicted of it. Yeah I, yeah, I don't want to go to hell, but I really enjoy those things. So I guess I'll have to enjoy my sin in hell. You know, no, that's right. They think of, of heaven as just a place for them to be happy, a retirement community. No, it's not. No, it's not. They would be very uncomfortable. Uh, uh, sinful human beings who cannot abide the presence of God. Our God is a consuming fire. Uh, yeah. There's not going to be any sin in heaven. Thank God for that. But here, Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, what? You must be born again. You must trust in God's Messiah. 
the one who will be lifted up for the sins of his people, just like the serpent was lifted up. You understand that? It's not a system of religion. It's not a system of doctrine. Although there, certainly there is teaching, but it is, that is not the reality. The reality of Christianity is to be born again, to, to be born by the power of God, according to the promises of the new covenant, into a new and living relationship with God himself in Christ Jesus. The rest is unnecessary. And unnecessary in as far as having eternal life. Faith in Christ is what's necessary. The, the an institution, a building, sacraments, those are not necessary for self. Faith in the Savior is personal. And God to save you is necessary. See, you can go to church all your life. You can be baptized. You can be confirmed. You can attend every worship service. You can tithe, triple tithe. You can be bap baptized by triple immersion. None of it will save you. God must save you. And that's always a personal thing. God does not save nations and peoples. He saves individuals out of nations and out of peoples. Have you been saved out of this world onto him? Do you belong to God? Has he purchased you with the blood of his son? Do you know, are you consciously aware that you belong to God? Or is that foreign to you? If it's foreign to you, let me suggest that you must be born again. That you're not actually saved. Or possibly not actually saved. Because, I mean, people can get saved and don't exactly understand what happened to them. But they know something happened to them. They know that they did not have the kind of faith that they have now. God changes you. The promises of the new covenant, what God does in the new birth, are enumerated in places, especially in Jeremiah 31, which is also quoted in uh, Hebrews, and Ezekiel chapter 36. So uh, Jeremiah 31, um, about, starting at verse about 31. And I know I've read this many times, but I'm going to have to. It's like the gospel. I guess you've got to preach it all the time. Uh, who knows who's listening? Okay, this is a prophet Jeremiah. This is what Nicodemus should have understood. Jesus is talking about the new birth. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. God's people, don't get hung up in the fact that you're not a Jew. Not important. But I don't want to explain that right now. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant with they, which they broke, uh, though I was a husband to them. Jeremiah is writing roughly 600 B.C. Uh, the Exodus occurred about 1500 B.C. So uh, almost a thousand years before where God brought his people, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, out of Egypt, out of bondage, and was taking them to the promised land. They became his people, uh, and he made a covenant with them at Sinai. Uh, we know that as the covenant of the law, the commonly called the Ten Commandments, but that's not correct. That was the beginning of the revelation of the law. The first five books of the Bible, 
uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those, that, those are the law, the, the, the Pentateuch or the, the Torah, that is the law. All the way from creation through the final part of God's revelation uh, through Moses. That's the covenant. Keep the law and you'll live. Break the law and you die. That's the curse of the law. Sin and death. See, the law does not save anybody. It simply shows you that you're a sinner and need to be saved. That's his primary purpose. So they, I gave them a covenant, but they broke it, even though God was taking care of them. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Talking in the future. A new covenant. Which is what Jesus said at the Last Supper he, when he took the cup of redemption of the Passover and said, this is a new covenant in my blood, which he was going to shed that very next morning on the cross. He said, God, this is the covenant, the, the covenant, the new covenant that Jesus spoke of, being born, which is being born again, is this covenant that Jeremiah is writing about, uh, prophesying about. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. If you believe in Christ, you're in the house of Israel. Says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds, not on tablets of stone, but write it in your mind and on your heart, and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God. And they shall be my people. It's not about an institution. He is our God and we are his people if you're in the new covenant. It's personal. No more will they will every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me. So it won't be a matter of, of doctrinal instruction, It'll be a matter of personal knowledge. They'll know me from the least of them to the greatest, from the least important, from the smallest to the mightiest, to the most honorable. They'll all know me. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. God will take, promises to take the barrier of sin that separates God from fallen humanity out of the way the one who's lifted up on the pole. Okay, let's go over to Ezekiel chapter 36. Starting at all oh, about verse 26. Now let's go to verse 24. For I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all countries. Now if you know the New Testament, you know this is God's people, the church, the true church, the spiritual church, which is invisible now. And bring you into your own land. Well, what's our land? The kingdom of God. Don't make this physical. This is more than the regathering of the nation of Israel. That, that's not particularly relevant. It is God's people, the new covenant. So God is promising they'll be scattered, but God's going to, you know, this was, they were going into exile during the, the time of Ezekiel, or were already in exile. There was a period of deportation, so it's an ongoing process. They're scattered in Babylon and other places. So I will, I will I gather you. And again, of course, then in 70 AD and 135, they were scattered again uh, because, well, that they're that kind of people. They just can't behave themselves. And I'll bring you into your own land. So you could take this superficially as a regathering of Israel to the land, but that's not really what God's about. That 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 is... 
insignificant compared to the reality of of uh, God's land. Uh, you know, as Scripture tells us that Abraham sought for a city that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. That doesn't exist on earth. Certainly not the city of Rome. Oh, man. Or Jerusalem. Man. No. Jerusalem's full of sinners. Been there. <laughs> Man, you will you there. There are born again people in Jerusalem, not many, but uh, the Jewish nation is in darkness, and man, on on the Sabbath you can hear it. Oh my! <sighs> Don't do not imagine that the, the Jews are godly people. I mean, you're, no, they're cut off from God. They rejected their salvation. They rejected the Savior. They have to repent of that. It's like we all have to repent of our uh, self-righteousness generally. And I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. This is a uh, reference to the uh, cleansing of the temple uh, in, the, in uh, the book of uh, Exodus, yeah, mostly. And I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your idols. So, But he's talking about uh, some people say this is baptism. No, it's not. It's uh, it's speaking spiritually in uh, using the language from the Old Testament. I will cleanse you from your filthiness and from your idols, from your false gods. Look in your own heart. You know what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. This is being born again. This is talking about the new birth. I will take out the heart of stone. What is, are stones living or dead? Dead. Are they soft or hard? Hard. Are they warm or cold? Cold. So I'll take that cold, dead, hard heart out, the heart of flesh, the heart of Adam, and give you a new heart that of flesh, living, warm, soft, tender toward God. I will put my spirit, this is the promise of the Holy Spirit, that was fulfilled on Pentecost. It's a gift of the Spirit, not the gift of gifts of the Spirit. Whether speaking in tongues is irrelevant. Totally irrelevant. It was just a fulfillment of a, a sign. It's not the issue. The issue is the gift of the Spirit, God himself. Also, the Spirit of Christ is the same thing. I shouldn't say thing, the same God, coming to dwell in you. You can't get more personal than that. That has nothing to do with doctrine. You can believe in the doctrine of the coming of the Spirit, but you have to have the Spirit. See, as Paul says, when you talk about whether a person is saved or not, Paul said, know ye not that the Spirit of Christ dwells in you? If any man does not have the Spirit of that Spirit, he doesn't belong to Christ. It's personal. You must be personally saved by God. Personally reconciled to God through what Christ did on the cross. You must trust in Christ personally. Without that, you're still dead in trespasses and sins. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will keep my judgments and do them. Why? Because the Spirit of God is at work in us both to do will and to do his good pleasure, as the New Testament says. This is what sanctification is, in part. First of all, we are purchased by God. We're set apart to God as his possession. That's what holiness is, by the way. It's belonging to God. For his, we're set apart to his use. There's nothing intrinsic about it. It's like the vessels in the temple. They were not holy because they were made of a different substance. They were holy because they belonged to God and they were for his use, not for common use. If you've been purchased by God, if you've been born again, you are his vessel. His, you are holy because you are his property. 
his children. It's not because you are intrinsically so. Yet, he's going to solve that problem too. Your flesh is still as unholy as ever, but you're not just flesh. Now, you've been born again. And you will dwell in the land I gave to your fathers. Well, what land was Abraham seeking? A city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God, the heavenly Jerusalem, as Paul talks about. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. And I'll deliver you from all your uncleanness, and call for the grain and multiply it, and bring no famine upon you, and multiply the fruit of the trees and the increase of the fields so that you will never uh, uh, again bear the reproach of famine among the nations. In other words, I will not pour out my judgment and my wrath upon you. I will bless you and protect you and keep you, because you're my children. As David said, I'd never seen the, uh, uh, the children of God, uh, God's people forsaken or their children begging bread in the street. It's true, I haven't either. I've worked with the homeless for many years, I did. Never, never, ever, ever did I run against a genuine born-again Christian that was truly homeless. Now, now, I can remember one who was voluntarily homeless. He'd go from shelter to shelter sharing Christ and living with him. But I wouldn't necessarily choose to do that myself. No, uh, but I certainly, God didn't call me to do that, put it that way. Now, God has to send you to, he, he, God can send you to some strange places, but it's, you better be sent by him, not by yourself, I'll tell you that. Uh, but no, God blesses us, and he's speaking in natural language here. But we should, if you're born again, you, you, don't, you can see past that. You can see the physical, the spiritual reality. So that's, uh, that, those are the promises in the, the major passages in the Old Testament about being born again, about the new covenant. Do you get that? I hope so. That's, that's what the gospel's about. And, you know, uh, I'd say that all these things they call churches out there, I just have to shake my head. I've pretty much given up on the whole idea. Uh, oh, man, there, there might be some good ones someplace, but, I mean, church is really simple. It's not complicated. But human beings corrupt everything. They do. They corrupt everything. And it, this has been this corruption has been going on for two thousand years, even in the days of the apostles, there are people corrupting things deliberately. But whether or not you go to a a, a Christian clubhouse, uh, that does not determine your salvation. <laughs> whether or not you belong to Jesus Christ, that determines your salvation. And, and don't let somebody make you feel guilty because the Bible says, neglect not the assembling of it yourselves together as the manner of some. Well, first of all, let me put it this way. Find a church and find out, do they actually assemble in the name of the Lord Jesus or are they assembling on some other basis? Well, that'll eliminate maybe 99% of them. <laughs> Do they have their own particular doctrines you have to believe? Do they have their own uh, confession of faith that you have to acknowledge? Do they have their own rules you have to abide by? Or do they accept you simply because you're born again and belong to Christ? And the worst of all, will they exclude you from the Lord's table because you don't meet their criteria? That's definitely, you know, that, talk about something that's really bad. Um, to say, well, you can't, uh, you can't eat of the Lord's table because uh, you don't meet our standards. 
Well, I would say that church has probably been cut off by Christ because they don't meet his standards. They're a sect, a cult. And, you know, it's like Rome. It's a cult. It's a sect. You have, you have to be in fellowship, in communion with the Pope. I say if you're in communion with Francis, you're in communion with the devil. How about that? You're not in communion with Christ. There's a lot of Catholics, in fact, that would agree with what I just said. But they should question <laughs> what they're in communion with. Uh, the one true church. There is one. Christ has only one church, but it's spiritual. It's not physical. It's not an institution. It is his people. Even Vatican II acknowledged that. Uh, don't you have to know Christ, and that's something that God must. He must initiate that relationship. He will call you to himself, but you must respond. As is written in the book of Hebrews, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Do not resist the call of God. Respond. He will call you to faith in his Son and to the understanding that because of what Jesus did on the cross and that alone, through faith in that, you are right with God and nothing else.